everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Six Considerations When Evaluating Your Next Content and Process Management Solution. I'm Teresa Resick, Vice President of Market Intelligence here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. Highland is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them very much for their support, and certainly thank you for taking the time to join us today. And before we get started, I just want to share a few tips for you for participating in today's webinar. Look to the chat feature where we'll be sharing some resources and some other tips and, and other links uh, throughout our time today. And just go in there right now and say hello. Let us know where you're listening from. Do ask questions of the speakers in the Q&A or in the chat feature, and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can all later in the webcast. We do have a little time carved out towards the end to take your questions, so feel free to submit them when you think of them. I would also appreciate it if at the end of our webinar, if you would take a few minutes to complete our feedback survey. I truly value what you have to say and your thoughts on how we did today, and so I would greatly appreciate it if you would do that. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to aim.org's Resources Learning Center page in just a few days. And right now I just wanna introduce the speakers that we have with us today. Thrilled to have the, this panel, um, an esteemed panel from Highland Software. We have um, Dennis Chepernoff, who is the manager of product marketing at Highland. And we also have Amanda Ullery, who's the senior manager of the portfolio, portfolio marketing at Highland. And I've had the pleasure of working with them in the past and I'm so thrilled that they're here to be speaking with us today. So right now I'm gonna turn things over to Dennis just to begin our talk on about these six considerations. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Teresa, thank you so much, appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So um, I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting year. Uh, last year, it's turning out to be another interesting year. So we're really excited at the opportunity to to chat uh, with the AIM uh, membership. So with that, I will go ahead and kick things off. So um, today we're talking about planning for your next content and process management solution. And we have some interesting tips and tricks to share with you that we've seen kind of some of our customers go through. Uh, we've seen uh, our consulting services organization frequently encounter and kind of advise customers on as well. So we're happy to share these with you. So I, before we get started with the, with the actual tips and tricks, uh, I think one thing that is worth acknowledging is that over the past decade and certainly over the last year, uh, the way we buy technology has changed dramatically in our organization. So we, you know, we're, we're definitely looking for quick solutions. We're looking for an agile deployment uh, ability to try things before we buy them. And, and I think because of such a wealth of great technology available out there and so many different options, we often kind of forget one critical step that we used to do when we bought software, and that step is discovery. So we often just kind of jump into uh, trying a solution because we, you know, we figure, well, what's the worst case scenario, right? If it doesn't work, we'll just we'll just try another one, and then another one, another one. And and unfortunately, when we skip discovery, you know, there are several key considerations that often go sort of um, unfulfilled or unacknowledged. And and oftentimes, when we jump sort of head first into trying solutions. We, there are some risk, risks associated with that. So one, we, we risk having a technology overlap. So we, you know, during discovery process, we often find out what technology our organization already owns, what could be repurposed, uh, what could ensure that there's a smooth integration between them and no conflict. Uh, we could also end up with a misalignment with our business imperatives. So we could inadvertently deploy a solution that negatively impacts employee or customer experience. We could also end up with uh, sort of a surprise bill at the end, you know, when we don't fully evaluate the total cost of ownership of a particular technology and deploying it and integrating it. 
And, and finally, when we don't go through a discovery process, we often miss out on the ability to review our industry's best practices by talking to consultants, talking to analysts, talking to other customers who have gone through similar process. So uh, I just wanted to take a quick moment to acknowledge that you know, everything that we covered today can, can be explored during the discovery stage. And uh, there's many, many other things that may come up in your discovery process as well. But we just wanted to focus on six key things that we think are pretty common, but there may be many, many others that will be relevant to your specific organization. So let's keep that word in mind, in mind discovery. It is important. So with that, let's, let's kick off with some of the quick tips here. So one, I, I call it dream big. Um, I think it's, uh, it's really important that when we look for our next solution, that we, we try to broaden the scope of uh, or our view of the information environment within our organization. So we often start with just seeking maybe a content management or a process management solution. And we basically view it sort of like, like a box, like here's our problem. A problem is a box within our organization and information comes in and somehow the information will also come out. And we, we don't always take uh, time to sort of consider the entire information life cycle. You know, how does that information get captured? How does it enter our organization? Are there any, any requirements around that, like data classification perhaps? or uh, regulatory requirements because it's considered uh, regulated information like private information, PII. You know, what's going to happen with it after my department is done with it? You know, is there collaboration needed? Does it need to leave the bounds of our organization? Do we need the ability to automatically destroy it after a certain period of time? So, so when, when you're looking at your particular area where you need a quick fix, you need to enable your workers with a quick solution, uh, take a moment to kind of expand that lens a little bit and look at the entire information life cycle for that data. Likewise, think about it from the perspective of your broader organization. So, you know, there's your department, but maybe accounting needs to touch that same data as well. Maybe it's, it's a different workflow, but they still need access to it. Maybe the records department does as well. Maybe facilities, you know, operations, marketing. Whoever else, it's really a good idea to kind of talk to your IT, talk to some, maybe your information governance group uh, to help you better understand the impact of that data and that operation and the solution that you're trying to put in place to make sure that, uh, again, you're avoiding risk, you're avoiding overlap, you're avoiding um, potential conflict or silos within the organization. So to sum up, really, when you think about this dream big, um, uh, tip, you know, think about it, first of all, from the strategic perspective. So think strategically as opposed to just locally to ensure that you're aligning with the organization's priority and uh, direction. Also think about it from the organization-wide perspective to avoid these unintended redundancies, conflicts, and inefficiencies. And finally, think about it from the perspective of the entire information life cycle. So that you can actually plan for what needs to happen to that information sort of from cradle to the grave, if you wish, because that information is your responsibility as the data owner of that particular solution. So that is our first tip, dream big. And with this, I'll pass this to Amanda to chat about our next tip. All right, thank you, Dennis. So our next consideration is don't make experience an afterthought. And I think we're all hearing a lot about experience um, these days. When it comes to selecting and implementing a process and content management solution, both customer and employee experience matter. So through customer interactions, through your user group, sales conversations, maybe enhancement requests on behalf of your customers, start to identify the things that matter most to your customers or to your patients or constituents or students and really determine how you can deliver those experiences. In right now in our accelerated kind of digital landscape, customer demands, expectations are at an all time high. And those are expectations for fast, tailored, personalized experiences. So think about the things that you can control when you are selecting a solution. 
And that includes adaptable, intuitive, modern interfaces, the ability to access your people, your services, um, your information online, via mobile devices, um, on demand, really intuitive and easy to use for your customer base. These are things that are just expected. Also think about the need to share externally. How will you share the needed information or documents um, with stakeholders that are right now outside your four walls, which is so important right now? And will the platform or the solution that you're investing in support that natively, or will you have to look for another tool in order to meet that use case? And then finally, and you know, Dennis already alluded to this, but customer needs are always changing. There's external factors obviously beyond our control, whether that's um, economic, medical, political, environmental, and they re it requires all of us to really be agile and to be flexible and to meet those changing needs. So making sure your solution can support that as well. And really in order to deliver those exceptional customer experiences, you need to ensure your employee experience is similarly high that your employees are empowered, that employee morale is high, they are productive. And it's really the same type of considerations when it comes to features and technology on the employee side as it is when we talk about more of the customer experience. So again, those intuitive modern interfaces, can your employees access what they need in order to make decisions while they're working remotely or on the go or in the field? Can they, make, can they, can they um, approve what they need to approve, make decisions on what they need to make decisions on? And then the ability to easily share and access information across departments, to share directly with customers. And of course, agility, just like customers, employee needs are always changing as well. And so the ability to adapt to those changing employee needs. In a, a brand new study that we commissioned with Forrester Consulting, we discovered that in the midst, especially of the pandemic, so over the, in 2020, over the past year or so, Experience improvements, which have been top of mind for several years, were cited as even more important drivers of content management strategy. Um, and that's really not surprising at all with all of the change that we've experienced, making sure that retention on both the customer and the employee side is type of mind, those experiences, that engagement. And so that same study also identified the top, both the top customer experience and employee experience benefits associated with effective content services. So how can a successful implementation of these strategies of solutions impact some of the factors that we just talked through? And so on the customer experience side, those that are doing content services or have successful content and process management solutions, what are some of the benefits they're realizing? And the top things that, that, that were reported are improved handling of inquiries requests, so that customer service, more personalized experiences, so those tailored interfaces, those tailored experiences, faster correction of errors and some processing improvements. And then on the employee side, we're seeing benefits, reaping the benefits of a greater ease of accessing and using those insights from content and data, but making better decisions based on those insights. Um, some more process gains, faster processing of approvals, and just the ability to find needed content and information. And so wrapping up this consideration, really the new or newish rules of engagement. First is that ensure the solution that you're looking for aligns with and supports some of your top level imperatives like customer experience, digital, digital transformation. You know, we are seeing within our customer base, within the organizations we're talking about, there are roles and titles and departments that are being formed around these initiatives. So making sure that your content and process management solution aligns with these larger organizational goals is key. Next, user adoption can make or break your implementation. So ensuring that you're consulting your employees, your end users, and your customers if possible, as early as possible in the solution process, in the discovery process to ensure the proper fit. And then finally, this third, this third rule of engagement um, kind of builds off number two, but consider how, where, and why users are accessing your tool. Things that we may have considered more kind of back-end type IT considerations like deployment model, architecture, security, integrations, those really matter when it comes to delivering, delivering experiences. So can users access the information they need from their Outlook inbox or from Salesforce or the other systems they live in on a daily basis? Um, is the UI conducive to work being done and flexible so you can create experiences tailored to different user roles or tailored to different business units? And this really segues nicely into our third consideration, which is to focus on the fit. So as you're evaluating content and process management strategy, 
new solutions, enhanced solutions, really considering the fit of your solution, both within your existing IT environment, as well as within the needs, of course, of your business. And we all have existing and often expensive and really mission critical, business critical systems that we rely on for everyday business operations. Things like our Salesforce CRM, an ERP, and maybe a human capital management system, or even our productivity tools. Word or Outlook applications. So of course, during that discovery, asking yourself the question of, it, of how will your solution complement or connect with these core critical business applications that your organization has already invested in. And of course, integration is really key here. And based on your IT landscape, based on your um, existing systems, you'll likely have some specific requirements for integration. So some things to consider. Um, consider things like, does your solution offering or your vendor offer a pre-built connector for your most critical systems, which makes it easier, faster to connect to those applications. So things like Epic or Workday, Salesforce, Guidewire. You may have other applications or other services that you need to integrate with your solution. So if that's the case, it's important to determine um, the degree of data level integration, tools, web services, APIs that are available to you to customize and tailor a solution that works for you, if that's a consideration. Some offerings will offer more um, point and click configurable or screen level integrations for core business systems. That might be advantageous, especially for specific portions of your workforce or certain business units that may not be power users, but need to, but are living in these day-to-day -day systems, are accessing screens frequently and need to pull the right content and the right information while staying in their kind of everyday business applications. And then in general, overall configurability of integrations is key, not only in getting up and running quickly, but also in adapting over time. Now, even with those key integrations, there's likely still going to be gaps in your overall application landscape. And you may have those today, that those core line of business systems just can't fulfill. And you may be using today antiquated access most of database applications, um, point solutions, maybe even Excel spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheet applications. And you know, especially as the, the world really changed with our recent pandemic, the need for brand new or heavily adapted business applications arose, you know, organizations are facing the decision how to round out their application building strategy. And so as you're evaluating your next content and process management solution or solutions, consider the approach um, that you would like to take that meets your needs to build out applications. And these will differ pretty extensively depending on the offering um, that you pursue. So depending on your needs, depending on your IT strategy, you may benefit from more repeatable or packaged solutions around a specific department, a specific use case. Or you may find a benefit in configuring using low-code tools or on a low-code platform. And this is something that we saw an uptick in interest in over the course of the past year plus as things were changing so quickly and the need for new applications or big changes within our business applications arose. So that's using drop-down menus, visual tools, checkboxes, radio buttons to configure and change solutions. Or perhaps you have the internal IT development resources or requirements for more of an open source approach. And an open source platform would be most advantageous to your needs. Or as the case for many companies, it may be a hybrid approach. Finding a, finding a solution within specific business units or portions of your organization that benefit from these. So again, finding in a, an application building strategy, the tools that support your requirements today and going forward is really key. And so by taking these things into account, like integrations, configurability, your application building strategy, you're able to mitigate some of the, the hazards of poor fit. I mean, these include things like manual processes or re rework that's required when things fall within the gaps. Um, poor fit also means information silos when different content is scattered across your organization and which leads to, by nature, just leads to knowledge gaps. Um, when your employees can't access the information they need in order to make decisions or effectively collaborate, they're switching between applications. Also support gaps, when you may have to go to multiple vendors for support for various applications or when those with maybe the intellectual property for a custom developed solution leave your organization and take that with you. 
with them. And of course, security and compliance, because it's really hard or, or maybe nearly impossible to govern an information and content landscape that's disconnected when you're not able to see a full view or a full picture of where all that data lies. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dennis to talk more about that in our next consideration. Thank you for the perfect transition, Amanda. That's, that's excellent. So we did want to talk today about sort of planning ahead of time for security and compliance. Um, oftentimes we see customers sort of get the solution first and then worry about how do we harden it? How do we ensure compliance? How do we make sure that all the right people have access and the wrong ones don't? And so um, it's definitely not something that should be considered simply as a bolt-on feature after the fact. So, you know, we live in a very complex information governance environment today. We have, you know, first of all, our data keeps growing within our organization at a, at a tremendous rate. So IDC, the IDC study estimates about 30% every year. Uh, that's, that's how much more data we're getting. And as, as our enterprises become more and more digital, you know, that's going to continue. We're going to continue and take more and more data uh, with our systems and processes. Um, but on the flip side, there's also more risk. So we continue having sort of these record years in terms of breaches, uh, both in, in the size of individual breaches and also the overall number of records compromised. So this is, this is a terrible uh, statistic. <laughs> and, you know, we, we haven't been able to plateau in this uh, space yet. And, you know, if anything, the landscape keeps evolving, you know, now we also have things like ransomware to worry about and, you know, which, which is really, really um, concerning, you know, considering how much important data we hold and how much our daily operations rely on this data. So uh, that's definitely something to think about as well. And then on top of that, we have more regulation. So as we have more data and more risk, you know, the regulators want to make sure that we're doing uh, a good job of keeping keeping it safe, and so we have industry-based regulations. We have cross-industry, you know, like privacy regulations, like GDPR or CCPA. Uh, we also have security requirements or security standards we have to comply with. So there's a lot happening, and it's it's pretty unlikely that if we just take a random solution off the shelf, that is it's going to be able to meet. Uh, our unique needs of, of our organization uh, and our industry. So it definitely requires some upfront research. So some of the things to think about. So first of all, in terms of security, uh, consider how the software is built. I know we don't typically look into that. We kind of assume all software is built equally, but it's not, it really isn't. So if the vendor uh, can, can really talk to you about sort of the secure development lifecycle they use and the role that security plays as they develop their software. So for example, at Highland, you know, it's, it's a key gate uh, at every stage of uh, software development cycle. So, you know, a, a reputable vendor will be able to have an intelligent conversation with you about uh, how they've built that solution and how they ensure that it continues being secured. Why is it important? It, well, first of all, it, it'll influence how hardened the solution is out the gate. And also if the vendor is already uh, sort of in this mindset of security, information security, it'll take them a lot less time to react to new threats or new vulnerabilities that are discovered, say in, in the browser or operating system, they'll be able to make the tweaks necessary a lot quicker than a vendor who really uh, doesn't, doesn't prioritize security. So definitely worth to consider uh, how the software is built. Um, also access controls, right? So Amanda mentioned, you know, all the different audiences, you know, the employees, the, uh, the customers, sometimes partners who may require external access uh, to certain information. So being able to really dial in that access and use group policies to ensure that you don't have to manage everybody individually, uh, but being able to basically start, you know, as, as they call it, uh, with the principle of least privilege. So, you know, uh, you know from, the, from the default settings, everybody has least privilege and, and then we add it based on need, not the other way around. We don't take it away based on no need, 
uh, we, we don't ever do that. So make sure that the solution is designed to give you those administrative controls to really uh, fine tune security the way you need it. And, and also uh, make sure that there are technologies available to you as part of the solution to mitigate some of these risks. So being able to, for example, encrypt data will help protect it against um, breaches and data being stolen or lost. Uh, having things like redundant configuration will help you, for example, mitigate against things like uh, ransomware attacks or denial of service attacks or, or even natural disasters, right? So, so there's a lot of other things that a solution provider may be able to offer if you, you know, kind of really consider the risk landscape and security landscape uh, you need around that data for which you're deploying a solution. Uh, in terms of compliance and regulation, regulatory considerations, similarly, you know, we have a few things that most organizations need to need to think about when they pick the solution. Um, one is how will you prove compliance? So most new regulations require that you are able to prove compliance. It's not enough to just say you're doing your best. Uh, so make sure there's reporting, there is analytics available as part of that package that can really show you what's happening to the data. Uh, who touches it, how is it modified, when is it deleted, when, you know, what other actions happen to it. This is all critical. And again, it requires that you know your own requirements uh, for your industry, for your particular data type, uh, so that you're able to select the right solution. Uh, make sure that you're able to locate information easily in this solution or across the solution and other solutions. So potentially you may need a federated search capability or enterprise search capability um, so that if you're served with a information request, uh, you're able to quickly locate that data and provide it uh, to the authorities or to the users or agencies that are, that are requesting it. So this is absolutely critical and really uh, the regulators won't look kindly on you if you just say, well, I don't have the technology to do it right. So make sure that you consider that as well. And also, as with any data these days, you know, I think the, the current landscape really encourages us to think of ourselves as not really data owners, but sort of data curators, if you wish. You know, we, we hold it for a while, we take good care of it, and then at some point we have to let it go because it's really not wise to keep everything indefinitely. So make sure that your solution uh, enables you to leverage uh, automatic destruction or archiving or transfer capabilities that, again, you need for your industry or for your particular use case, uh, because without it, it'll quickly become a nightmare. So as you saw, you know, the data continues to grow. There's various types of data. So HR data has different requirements in terms of retention compared to, say, legal data or, or tax data. So you need to really have a robust capability to manage retention automatically. It's not feasible to do it manually anymore. So that should be definitely a key consideration. I'll take this one uh, ne next tip as well. And, and this one deals more with expertise. And I hope that uh, as we're talking more and more about everything that's all the considerations that surround your your new solution, you're starting to get the sense that there's a lot that goes into making the right decision. And so, uh, you know, besides simply selecting the right vendor and the right solution, there's all these other considerations to think about. You know, there's security we talked about, Amanda talked about integration, you know, all the different deployment capabilities from package to low code to, to open source. Uh, somebody has to think about the infrastructure where the solution will reside. Somebody else will think about uh, all the uh, different user groups that need access to it. So a lot happening there. And at some point, you may, you know, you may be just just your department, right? You're just looking out for your for your little group of people. But you may need to ask yourself, like, do I really want or or do I have the capacity to support all these different aspects of the solution? within my team, is it reasonable to ask them to do that? So when you do that, again, during your sort of planning and discovery process, it's helpful to know that there is usually plenty of help available 
especially from the right vendor who specializes in your particular area or your industry. So let's just do a quick overview of some of the things to, to keep in mind in terms of if you need to get help, what kind of help should you ask for? So one, uh, consider uh, using consulting services. So again, many vendors like Highland included will provide consulting services that help you do some of the initial discovery, some of the planning will help you really understand your requirements, understand your uh, internal and external um, best practices, you know, based on other companies like you. And, and leveraging a consultant up front like that can really not only speed up your deployment, but it can also help you get to that ROI a lot quicker. So why reinvent the wheel if, if your vendor has already, or the consultant has done work with similar customers in your industry and they know exactly what works best and what kind of what toggle switches you need to flip on your solution. So that's one to consider. Another one is implementation services. So when it comes to actually deploying your solution, again, there's a lot happening. It's not a simple sort of install and, and walk away. Uh, you may need integration. You may need an actual uh, implementation plan where you have to manage various teams, you know, IT and, and business users and testers and end users and and decision makers and all these things will need to man be managed. So implementation services is another type of help you can get to kind of offload that and just say, okay, that's the solution. You know, we, we're sign off on this implementation plan. Now, please somebody else manage it because we've got real jobs to do in my department. So, so that's, that's another one to think about. Also, don't forget to think about your old data. So sometimes our solution, a new solution is kind of replacing an old solution potentially or an old workflow. And there may be data residing uh, in systems that we used to do this job or in spreadsheets or our old databases, uh, things that are antiquated perhaps and need to, be, need to be replaced at some point. So really think about data conversion because data conversion can help you not only uh, sort of create an optimal working environment for your workers, but can also reduce security uh, risks and compliance risks. Because if you think about those older systems, well, they were designed 10, sometimes more years ago before the current requirements for security and compliance. So if you're thinking, well, I was like, I'll just keep that old system working until we sort of retention out all those old records and just have you know, people work in the new system as you know, with all the new information. Well, that old system is, is sort of an ongoing cost center and, and, and a risk to you as well. So, so think about that. If you work with a data conversion service, there are multiple options available these days. It's not sort of rip and replace and, and one you know, massive migration of data. Uh, there's a lot of options available to migrate kind of on demand or as you go along, uh, there's federation uh, capabilities available. So it's worth exploring what, what the options are uh, to, to not have to deal with that headache later. And finally, I'll mention managed services. So sometimes um, you really don't want to manage that solution on ongoing basis, perhaps uh, you know, you don't have the infrastructure in-house or you don't have somebody really who can manage it on the ongoing basis on your team or, or IT's understaffed and they don't want to really take it on. So considering whether the solution can be offered as a managed service would completely remove that burden, that overhead of managing the infrastructure, uh, in deploying updates, monitoring performance, monitoring security, you know, all of those things can be sometimes managed by your vendor or another, another party. So uh, those are just some of the options available. Definitely kind of consider based on your discovery what makes the most sense uh, to, for your particular use case. And with that, I'll pass it back to Amanda. Hey, thanks, Dennis. So our sixth and final consideration is to look to the future. You know, Dennis and I talked through five other considerations that mostly dealt with the today and the here and now. Um, but in addition to what you need now, it's important to consider obviously what you will need down the road. So some things to think about as you're looking toward the future and making sure you're really making a future-proof investment. 
First is the, the vendor or provider investment in R&D. A lot of providers in the content and process management space do a lot of different things. So really consider, you know, during your discovery process, how committed is a vendor to this particular solution, to content and process management based on their invested resources, time and knowledge investment and development roadmap and things like that. Um, the other thing to consider is the innovation of your solution or your provider. You may not thinking, you may not be thinking right now about things like AI, machine learning, blockchain, RPA, but a vendor that's already focusing on these emerging technologies, already leveraging these emerging technologies within their customer base, discovering how they can fit within or complement the solutions they're offering will ensure that when the time is right for you and when you are ready, whether it's this year, one year, three years, five years down the road that they're ready for you. And you may have other peer references, customer references, early adopters and can benefit from those experiences. Um, RPA specifically, you know, we're hearing a lot within our customer base and interest in RPA and some of the efficiencies that can be gained within even existing automated processes with some robotic process automation capabilities. And then finally, um, we talked a lot about this through today's presentation, but thinking about the scalability flexibility of the solution. You may be looking at one department today or one process, but can your solution scale as you grow, as your organization grows? Can it be easily adapted and change as your organization changes? Really ensuring that you have success not only today, but with your initial implementation, but down the road as well, really finding that long-term strategic fit. And ultimately, I think if the past year plus has taught us anything, it's to expect the unexpected. One of the findings in that same Forrester Consulting study, um, that Highland Commission that I mentioned earlier, is that those that have made content services, really effective content and process management, a high priority of those organizations, 70% say they nav have navigated the pandemic with only slight to no disruption. And so for us, this is, this is telling, it, it's, it's telling us that solidifying and strengthening your content and process management solution today will help you be nimble and agile, adaptable, potentially to other unexpected changes that might come your way. So very, very key and something that we're hearing from the organizations that we are working with today. So with that, I will turn it back over to Dennis. He'll recap and then talk through some additional resources and next steps. I thank you, Amanda. So we talked about quite a lot today, so in just a half hour. And um, you know, we started out with, with talking about kind of keeping, broadening your scope a little bit, broadening your lens a little bit. And, and looking at your particular need, your particular solution in the aspect or in the context of the entire information life cycle at your organization. And also uh, from the perspective of your entire organization, not just your, your department. So a good way to do it is to really work with your information governance committee or your IT and some of the other departments that, that are in that workflow. Uh, another tip we, we talked about today is really prioritizing that user experience and customer experience as well and not making it an afterthought because really, uh, you know, customers and, and employees even today are expecting very high levels of functionality from their uh, remote working experience or buying experience. And so being able to really meet that requires that you plan for it up front and not try to sort of configure it later with, with whatever you, you have available. Uh, likewise, it's important to focus on the fit of the solution and think about all the different options in terms of your integration requirements and solution development uh, or deployment requirements. You know, everything from package solutions to low code and uh, to even open source solutions that uh, your IT can, can really customize. Uh, we also talked about planning from, for security and compliance from the beginning, as opposed to try to kind of solve that issue later. Uh, it may be too late. You know, you, you may really need to focus on that upfront to make sure you get a solution that's designed for your particular use case, for your particular industry, uh, and, and can meet those requirements uh, upfront. Um, we also talked about uh, making uh, 
the best use of available expertise, maybe from your vendor, from other consultants, to really help you with managing not just the discovery process, but also implementation, data migration, as well as uh, being able to potentially even host your solution remotely. And finally, we talked about looking beyond, so kind of look, uh, building in a little bit of bandwidth and capacity into your solution and, and vendor choice to really um, make sure that it, that solution or vendor can still meet your needs next year and, and maybe even five years or more down the road that they're committed, that they have the expertise and, 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 the, uh, and the focus to really continue supporting you and, and your industry going forward. So all of these, again, I mentioned earlier, all of these are technically considered sort of part of discovery process. There's many other things that you may uh, need uh, to consider during your discovery process. And again, that's where a consultant can help in that particular area. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, you know, we know that uh, there's a lot of information we discussed and what can you do with all that information? Well. For starters, you can start using it to, to evaluate your vendors and solutions as you start uh, you know, looking for your, your next uh, process or a content management solution. And you, know, you can definitely use it to evaluate Highland. So we, we welcome you to do that. Uh, we have put together this ebook, Discover Highland, which actually, which actually helps our customers kind of look at their needs and uh, look at them from the holistic view of the information lifecycle. And, and all the different uh, things that they may need to consider. And it also has some helpful quotes from our existing customers that may, may help you in your decision as well. In addition to that, we have several other resources that will be shared with you as part of this webinar. Uh, you know, we definitely welcome you to look at the most recent Gartner Magic Quadrant for content services platforms to really get a sense for where technology sits right now. Uh, you know, what are some of the options for you in terms of vendors and providers and solutions? I think it's a really good overview to, to check out. And also we have a couple other ebooks that can help you with your selection process and sort of figuring out, uh, you know, how to best make use of the available technology for your particular organization. If you're not familiar with Highland, so we are actually a leading content services platform provider and we have nearly three decades of experience in this particular software development space and supporting customers. This is the only thing we do, uh, the only thing we have done since the company was founded. So we look forward to supporting our customers uh, for the long run. And uh, if you want to learn more about Highland, we welcome you to uh, visit highland.com where you can find a lot of other resources, best practices, examples, demos, as well as that, actually, that Forrester study that Amanda mentioned, so that, that uh, is uh, available as well. So with that, I will conclude and pass the mic back to Teresa for a, a q and I believe. Yes. Uh uh, thank you. We've been listening to Dennis Chapernoff and Amanda Ullery. And um, I, I just put in their link to resources. And so all of those really cool ebooks and those things that Dennis just mentioned, including a PDF of the presentation that Dennis and Amanda have given, uh, that's all included in that resources link. And one of the things that um, that you had on your recap slide, um, it, it, when I took a look at your, at your presentation earlier today, I, one of the things that struck me um, it, it came to point on the on that recap slide in your sections where you had your know, dream big and take the experiences of customers and, and employees into consideration. Um, AIM has a recent paper uh, on our state of the industry that I thought complemented that message really well, and you know one of the key findings in that research. And pull my note in front of me here. Um, is that the point to align business and technology strategies to bring those together. And I think that's part of the dream big and taking experiences into consideration that bringing business and technology together um, so that the organization can succeed. And so um, uh, we're gonna drop into the chat right now, links to download that ebook for the state of the industry and also a companion infographic um, just to get more information out there to help you. So. Um, 
I do want to open this up to questions right now. And um, so feel free to submit them in chat or in the Q&A. Uh, but I have a question here. Um, let me go ahead and start with this. When it comes to managing the information life cycle, you know, who in the organization should be responsible for that task? Um, Dennis, did you want to take this first one? Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I've mentioned a couple of times, I think the information governance uh, committee or, uh, uh, you know, and any other kind of central sort of decision body for the organization. So we're finding that more and more customers are realizing that they really need to centralize uh, this overview of information governance. And, and again, in part because there's so much information within the organization now, in part because there are so many risks and so many different considerations that, that need to be made. So our advice typically is that um, it's not a one person job. So with given all the different data types and different business requirements, um, it's really important to have a uh, actual committee that manages information governance that looks at the organization as a whole at the entire life cycle of all the different data types within the organization. And typically who would make the best team for that would be um, you know, people from uh, business groups or business groups that are heavy on data, be it accounting, be it HR, be it uh, you know, other business organizations, um, somebody from legal, somebody from IT, an executive champion, because at some point, whatever that information governance uh, committee decides will need to be enforced and put into policy. So it's really important to have executive backing for these initiatives. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of research done on information governance committees, but I can't stress enough how important it is to have <clears throat> somebody charged or somebody's charged with that, uh, with that task within the organization. And again, it will be specific to your particular industry. So, you know, there may be other roles that may make sense. And, and one thing I'll mention real quick, I saw, I saw a great comment in the, in the mm -hmm. Q&A, somebody, somebody pointed out that the IDC study was from 2025. They call it uh, data age 2025 because they project sort of the, the, uh, um, the trends of data and information uh, governance through the next, you know, five or so years. So, so this study was a projection, sort of from from twenty one to twenty twenty five or something like that. So, the study wasn't from the future. I'm sorry. I wish I could give you that, <laughs> but not today. But good, great point. Good eyes. Thanks. Um, I know in your talk you talked about uh, privacy concerns um, and and certainly security within the organization and. I see that as having the right people having access to only the information that they need to do their jobs, not access, everybody being accessed to anything. But what about privacy concerns with managing data in the cloud? Um, which one of you would like to take that one? Yeah, I can, I, yeah you if you to... want to have been, Dennis, you're in the governance and privacy space right now. Yeah, absolutely. No. You know, there, there's a lot. There's a lot happening when you start sharing that data with third parties. So you know, when you need to consider sort of um, having your solution run in the cloud for whatever reasons, maybe managed services, maybe just for disaster recovery considerations as well. Um, you know, you'll just need to make sure that your cloud provider or whatever data centers they're using can actually comply with those the same requirements that uh, you're, you're charged with by or regulations like GDPR or CCPA. In fact, if you look at those privacy regulations, uh, you're ultimately, you know, if you're the one collecting data for business purposes, you are the last stop in terms of responsibility for that data. So you can't say, well, uh, you know, it's my cloud provider and they didn't have good enough security or they didn't have, you know, this or that they're not going to let that slide. So uh, it's your job to make sure that your providers have passed the requirements that are imposed on you and can test, you know, can, can actually have uh, proof for you that they're complying with these requirements, uh, that they're, they're taking the necessary step to provide steps to ensure that they're enforced 
uh, actively. So, you know, and with data centers, I mean, it can range from anything like physical security, right? Like who can walk in the door and, and get access to the server uh, to things like disaster recovery. I mean, under GDPR, for example, it's it's considered a, 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 an offense basically of GDPR if the data is not available. Uh, so, you know, if, if something happens to the data center, there's a fire or something, and for some reason your data goes offline, technically you're in violation of GDPR for that type of data. So again, it, it's your responsibility to make sure that whatever requirements your legal team tells you you're under with these privacy regulations, you can then take to your vendor and make sure that they can attest that they will be able to comply with those as well. And especially if you're in a hybrid situation where you have some servers you're managing yourself and then others you're relying on the cloud, you have to weigh those risks of physic of your physically maintaining those servers and what are your redundancies and backups if power gets cut to your building versus what um, cloud providers can provide and with privacy and all of the regulatory requ requirements industry, as well as things like GDPR and CCPA, there's so many things to factor into making those decisions. So um, no doubt a lot to pull into these considerations. Um, one more question that I wanna uh, put in here um, that, that someone has asked, yeah, you didn't touch much on RPA technologies, and I know that that is something that is so valuable in organizations. Um, how are you seeing organizations using RPA as part of their content and process management solutions? I can I can at least start on this one, yeah. um, Dennis. So something that we're seeing at Highland, you know, we we have a, a Highland RPA offering, and it's something that our existing content and process management customers are really excited about leveraging, where we're seeing it add value is in filling in some gaps in existing automated processes, really another tool in an intelligent automation toolbox. And so, you know, especially around processes that are very standardized, structured data, high volume work, integration challenges where you know, organizations can use RPA bots to replicate data or execute tasks um, between systems as part of a process without you know, intensive or time consuming, expensive integrations. Um, we're hearing about back office use cases. So within finance and accounting and within HR, um, so use cases like that, but really seeing it as an additional, an additional tool within a, a process automation or an already an automated solution, really almost op continuing to optimize that, get rid of some of those most menial, tedious tasks that are still requiring um, some human interaction today. Um, I just want to go ahead and take a moment and share just a couple of extra points here, just as a way of summing up a little bit, because I know we're getting close to our to our webinar time today. Um, just what I'm proposing here are some next, next steps for folks to take. You know, certainly turn to AIM as a resource, you know, research learning, and there's a wealth of, of opportunities, uh, of learning opportunities that AIM provides. So, you know, go to AIM.org, check out all of the different things we have there. Certainly our commu online community is robust and a lot of good people to talk with there uh, as a resource for you. Um, one of the other points here, very specific to what um, Dennis had mentioned at one point in the organization where expertise matters, talk with suppliers and, and your service providers. Uh, folks you're already working with, reach out to some other people. Um, all of these organizations are here to help you as an organization be able to do your jobs well and serve your constituency well. So you know, reach out and, um, pick the brains of, of all of the service providers that are here to help you. Um, one of the things that I like to suggest is just pick one of the things that we've discussed today. Um, Dennis and Amanda have shared a lot of really good points there. Take one of those things back to your organization right now uh, as a talking point, um, just to help you further along your digital transformation journey. There's a, a lot of good information um, in with the processes and practices that you do. And there's some, a lot of good tips that were shared today. And certainly, I, as I like to say, information management begins with you. So um, have this incumbent on yourself to go ahead and make that happen in your organizations. 
And just as we're bringing our, our session here to a close, um, I just wanted to say that we have been recording this webinar and you can catch it all again. We'll send a link out um, in just a, a later today or tomorrow, we'll send a link out so that you can catch the replay. And so you can hear it again, invite others to listen to it. I certainly look to the resources that we've been sharing with you. Um, that link is in the chat. Please take our feedback survey. Um, but I very much wanna thank our underwriter Highland. Uh, without support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you our free educational programs. So I just very much wanna thank Highland for their support. And as we are here, uh, as we do come to the close here, I just do want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thought or a key takeaway. So let me begin first with Amanda Ullery um, from Highland, your closing thoughts today. I yeah, mute myself. Thanks, Teresa. And thanks again, everybody, for, for joining us and for sticking around for this. I think, you know, thinking about the best practices, the considerations that we shared today, the agility piece really comes to mind. I think just all of the exchange, we've, all of the change that we've all experienced over the past year plus knowing and not knowing what's to come, really looking at your processes, looking at your um, employees, looking at your customers and trying to make sure the decisions you're making today are gonna scale well for the future. Um, and something that we didn't hit on, I guess also is making sure you're leveraging other customers, other peers, customer case studies, references, looking at the successes and what other organizations are doing with intelligent information technology or something we're doing in our day-to-day -day lives on Amazon and looking at reviews and you know going through the same process with your, your larger um, content and process management decisions is really key. So thanks for having us. Thanks, Amanda. And Dennis Chapernoff, your closing thoughts today. Sure. Um... Well, you know, one thing that I, I think continues to fascinate me about our industry is that, you know, ECM has been around for three plus decades in some shape or another. And, and I think oftentimes, you know, when we're looking at sort of the business needs of organizations and we're, we're trying to solve uh, new, new challenges and new requirements, we sort of have this preconceived notion that, well, that, that's ECM, you know, we, we, we've done ECM three times you know, already, so it's definitely not an ECM problem we're tackling. And so I encourage you, if you haven't looked at content services as a space in a while, I encourage you to, to investigate it. You know, go download that Gartner Magic Quadrant. Content services is so much more than what ECM used to be. You know, back in the early days of ECM, we went to the record system or the content management system to get work done. Well, the whole concept behind content services is it meets you, it meets your customers, it meets your employees and partners in their, in their business processes. You know, you don't need to adapt to the system. The system adapts to you and your ideal work processes. So check it out. There's there's so much innovation happening in the space. And sometimes it blows my mind, you know. We now have AI, blockchain, RPA, as Amanda mentioned. It, it is not what ECM used to be. It's not your granddaddy's ECM system that you deployed 20 years ago. So so I welcome you to please check it out and and and, and look at all the opportunities you have, you know, coming out of. Uh, the last year and having some of these interesting new technologies available now and doing some amazing things with them going into the rest of 2021, 2022. Thanks, Dennis. And that brings us to the end of our time today. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Highland, for your sponsorship. And we will see you with our next event. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.